not much fun to watch that because it's not a miracle, is it? <laughs> well, anyone can do that. <laughs> Try it. Uh, do this. Okay, it comes again down to that. And uh, so then we got that. It was our tool. And then another vision became, we said, and now we said, oh, whatever, well, now we're getting into something really good. Because we said, if we can do that with this, because this is more or less the, the ultimate tool. I mean, it's just as simple as you can get. <coughs> this is as simple as you can get. And this is as simple as you can get. And we said, well, those are what we want to do if we want to do really precision work for a moment. So, you know, as people thought of us as jugglers, this is what everyone sees. Then the jugglers started to invent this new idea, but you're talking about it too. Is in fact, a juggler isn't just somebody that can talk to balls or clubs or have a dialogue or create something like that. A juggler has a kind of contact or communication with every object in the world. My lock, my pain. A juggler, in fact, what happens then is that opens up the world because we weren't stuck with juggling 13 rings or 7 balls or 12 clubs or whatever now. We had every object in the world back to what we could do is we could lift. But we didn't need to throw it in. Because the idea then wasn't, I'm going to throw it and catch it. This idea is if this object decided one day, if I walk up and said, What do you want to do, Mr. Chair? And he's like, do this. But he can't, because he can't. I have to go ask him in a different way. This communication that touched the barber was talking about. And we're going to spend time, we're going to spend hours, we're going to spend days this chair and find out that if I touch it in different places, it's going to move in different ways. If I touch it there, it's going to swim. And if I touch it there, it's going to swim. And if I hold it like this, it's going to bounce into it. <laughs> and, uh, and all of a sudden, we realized that we're like Dr. Doolittle in the film. Then we did. We got fed up with uh, people that we saw every day. And we started going to talk to the animals, but we didn't talk to them. talk to people. The things that they didn't talk anymore. And we learned a new language for every object and that's what's fueling now research or juggling training in Europe now. At the school where I'm from, Centre National de la Cirque in Chalon Champagne, okay, we started <coughs> to redefine different problems of how you approach juggling as an art and how juggling as an artist. Because we spent so long with this miracle idea and this demonstration idea and this radio of, of God kind of thing. And, um, found out the problem, one of the basic problems for a juggler as an artist was that we only had one structure. After all these thousands of years, we only had one structure, which meant you did your next best trick at the very beginning. So it was always really good. And you popped all your stuff in the middle. And then you did your best trick at the end. So people remembered that you were really as good as you were at the beginning. And that was it. That was our structure. And so now, if we want to go somewhere as an artist, jugglers, we realize that we have to, to use other structures or try to put, find other structures that are going to be either adaptable to juggling. We have to try to find if there's another structure in juggling we haven't seen. We're doing experiments now with language, for example, where we take uh, the jugglers in the class, they didn't know this thing when I said, list 26 of your favorite tricks. They listed 26 other tricks, and it took them a while to do that because they, some of them wanted to do the best ones, and some of them wanted to do the easy ones because they didn't know what was coming up. And they figured it was going to be something pretty tricky because it was me. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so they listed the 26 tricks, and I said, okay, now you go A, B, C, D, just all the way to Z beside your tricks. And each juggler created his own alphabet because what we wanted to get at was this, see, there's still this miracle job and it's what, what the world expects from us. Juggers think they need to have thousands and thousands and thousands of tricks and they're always looking for a new trick. But we only have 26 letters and 10 numbers and a couple of punctuation points and we've written millions and millions of books. So I said maybe a juggler doesn't need any more 26 tricks. And if we use how to know how to find out how to use a right or find out how to get some meaning into it, then the juggler's going to do another step towards being an artist like musicians are, like uh, painters are, writers are. And um, so the idea was that they would take their tricks and we'd give them words. At the very beginning, the first was just to give them the, how do you say, the vowels, A-E-I-O-N-E. And they had to go through their own personal alphabet. And 
and find the tricks that were in AEIM and U and put them all together. But the trick was, see, now this is like uh, neutral in car. And this is your basic figure. There's two basic figures. There's this and there's this. Interesting point, per parentheses, that juggling has been found in a lot of South Pacific islands done by women. And they all juggle like this. And on all the Western world, you never juggle like that. That was always the second step. The Westerners always juggle like this. And they wonder, a lot of people are realizing that in cultures where they only have an oral tradition, there's nothing written down, there's no written transmission of culture, everyone juggles like this. But in the West, where you to read and write, we have a written culture and juggle like this. So scientists are off. I don't know where it goes, <laughs> but they say, oh, people that, because the people that don't write, they don't know how to do this one. <laughs> people that write don't know how to do the other one. And we have to work really hard to do the other one, because this is always the same one. When I do, okay, wait a minute, do, do something here. Because it all looks, you, okay, you admit, are you going to admit that it's a miracle? <laughs> okay. Admit it, everyone went, oh, when I brought the balls out, it's going to juggle in me. Oh, so it's a miracle. <laughs> so it's really simple. Okay, look. Follow the red ball. Got it? That's it. So if you do it with your channel. So in 15 minutes, you can all learn it. So another time, the second time, I'll do a workshop. I'll teach everyone how to do it. But uh, so what, what did I want to do with those parentheses about that? And, okay, so back to the, the idea about languages. So everyone had it. That was the basic figure in the beginning. So the idea was that they couldn't go from one figure to the next using the neutral position, unless it was a trick, one of the vowels that they had written down, which meant that pushed them to create new transitions between tricks that they never thought were possible, because they usually, I'm going to go back to what you said before about, oops, when I come out from behind the tree, you see, I said, oh, look what God made me do. It's because I'm basically a really lazy person. I didn't like to go out and hunt tigers and things like that. I tried to find something a lot easier to do. And jugglers have this kind of quest. When they start doing something, it's all over the place, and the arms move and the And we want to get down to where we're actually doing the least amount of movement possible. And we touch something in just the way we need to touch it, and it's going to go just to where I want it to go, so I don't have to move. And I don't have to sweat. I don't have to like, go chase it or something like that. Crawl under a table. So basically, joking is this search for a kind of comfort, but in a kind of, maybe, I don't know, I'm not going to say a spiritual level, but there's something really weird about it. There's something in it. Okay, like, like the, go back to my red ball. This might be it. We're wondering if this is it. See the red ball again? What's it doing? Okay, again, did it remind you of anything? Eight. Silent. Oh, silent. Wait, an eight. An eight, well, how? There you go. <laughs> there you go. We're back to God. <laughs> and we're back to the universe, and we're back to everything else. And what's happened is, I don't know, we found it. Somehow, we're saying, look, well, there's, you know, it's like, we were gods once, or we represented gods once. And now, we knew the mind and stuff. We still remember we have all this stuff that's left over. And it's like, sometimes you get the impression, it's like if, if all the Norse gods, Thor, and Odin, and everything is still around, they really did exist. And now you see them wandering around the streets of Amsterdam with horns on. And you go and laugh at him and take the piss out of him, but he's actually Thor, you see. And now we've, got, we've gone through all that, and we have to, like, we're attached to the universe because we actually juggle infinity. We've had to deal with that. That was a hard thing. But we had to, it's not enough now because people don't believe in these miracles anymore. There's other new miracles. So we had to become artists to make this step. So now I'm back to my alphabet idea again. And they had to hook, they found new transitions between their, their tricks that they didn't necessarily have before, which made them become different jugglers because the tricks in themselves weren't important anymore. All the work was on how you hooked them from one to another. And that's where the creative bit came in. Afterwards, seeing that a lot of jugglers you know, say, like, okay, you're going to do art now. Oh, yeah. And you have to say something now. 
people, they always ask us, they say, okay, you're going to do what? What do you want to say? What do you, what do you, what do you want to say? Tell, what do you want to tell everybody? It's really cool. <laughs> yeah, okay. After that, I don't know. After that, we're lost. After it's really cool, we're lost. And that's how we get a bit uh, stuck with our technology. Our own technology is really cool, but people don't want really cool anymore. We have to do a show. I'm talking from from a performer's point of view, not a hobby juggler's point of view. Because hobby jugglers do tricks like they do like stance. You know this one? But they don't worry about any kind of performing method. So they didn't know what they wanted to say, and I told them what they had to do. For Monday, they had to do their name. They had to juggle their name. Oh my God. And there was one guy in the class who was a Spanish guy. There was, there was four in the class. There was a Spanish guy, an American, an English, and a German. And they all had to juggle their name. And the Spanish guy, this is going to be really good, because he was called Manolo Alcantara. <laughs> so he had all these O's, and he had all these A's. And he had to work the weekend and when he came back, he juggled his name. And you had, all of a sudden, you had this repetition in his first name of O's, and you had a repetition in his second name of these A's. And you felt some, there was a rhythm that started to grow. But what he did, so he, uh, we confronted another problem with the juggling, was how long do you have to do a trick for it to, ex to exist? But we don't worry about that with letters, do we? So, like, for example, this was a trick. But you have to hold it ten times for people to understand what it is, or if you just do once, does it exist? And that's the big metaphysical question as jokers have, how long does it exist? And um, <laughs> it's true, it's true. So we had it with Manolo Alcantara. They said the name's really good, but every letter was exactly the same length. I went, Manolo Alcantara. <laughs> and they said, do we call you that? Do we call you Manolo Alcantara? He said, no, Manolo Alcantara. I said, okay, well, put your A's in your eye. Joke is different. Now, all of a sudden, we got into this meaning. Well, there's already a name. It was like a, we knew who it was. But what happened was jugglers need this new work to find some sense to what they're doing. They have to they need in these little plots. We're getting into, I think, a bit of a problem, too. I kind of heard it pop up yesterday and today. Is that this whole problem with the technology and what do we want to express with it? In fact, usually it's not what we want to express with first. We have to decide what we want to express ourselves, really, what we want to say to somebody, and then we figure out what's the best technology to use to do it. Some people do origami and some people do joking. But they all say something about themselves and they express it part. So, so we juggled Manolo Alcantara differently. And then, then afterwards, we started getting into things a bit more complex. Did you do a poem? Did you do a sentence? And then we got into a point that was really interesting. Since there are four different nationalities involved, I wrote P-A-I-N on a piece of paper and I showed it to each one of them. They weren't allowed to say it. And they all went, okay, okay, and you get there and you start doing the tricks. And what was interesting was that people who were more or less English speaking understood pain and their, 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 their rule that we had to give them was that they had to interpret it now. We had to get the idea of what they were juggling across. So two people understood pain, and the Spanish and the German girl understood bread, because we were in France. <laughs> so we had the same letters, but all of a sudden the meaning behind them wasn't the same for each person that was there. And what was interesting was that the girl that juggled bread, for example, was all stiff and she said, she's all puffed out because she was going to bag it. And then saying, for her, it was all puffy and it was all stiff and everything. And the, and the people that were in the audience that un, were thinking pain and were like, oh, God, it's horrible, it's horrible, she's suffocating and everything. <laughs> and then for one of the guys that was juggling pain, he had his clubs, he was juggling really fast, and he was like, he was oppressed, he was tight, he was like, compressed, he was everything. And the guy, the Spanish guy that was eating some bread, said, oh, that's really great. He's hungry, and the baguettes are so hot that he can't hold it. <laughs> and, but everyone got something out of it, and everyone put something into it. And what was interesting is that it's finally starting to get across to certain jugglers that um, the, the meaning, it doesn't matter what the meaning is in it or what the people understand in the beginning, but if we want to get out of this mini miracle and this object-driven kind of goal, we have to put some meaning back into it because that's the only contact that we're going to have with the people. And they're going to understand what they want. And our job afterwards is to be more or less precise or how we use our tools to get our idea across. But we have to have an idea inside before it's done.
Any questions? Yeah. That was a question. Another musician 
And then I'd like to play you some examples from that and talk about this. But in between this sort of musical uh, ending, uh, which I hope will be perceived as that, uh, I'd like to maybe entertain some discussion about the various uh, more sort of not philosophical, but kind of science aspects. I, I'm not a philosopher. In fact, I was raised at, uh, as a psychologist uh, in sort of behaviorist traditions. So I have these scars still from the old uh, <laughs> that experience. And, and uh, it's a little, you know, I wasn't allowed to use the word mind when I was an undergraduate. It was just forbidden. Uh, <laughs> so, but I'll, I'll, I will want to, I'm free of that. When I, <laughs> Well, anyway, first off, I'd like to say something about um, perception. Okay? And I think it's very important to recognize that perception really is action-oriented. It's not something we do in a vacuum. And I want to give you a couple of examples of, that demonstrate that perception is this kind of very action-oriented uh, phenomenon. Uh, the, one of the experiments that gets cited all the time, and I, I'm going to cite it here again along with some others, is one by... Uh, held and Hine, and what they did was they took young kittens, very, very young kittens, and one group of them was uh, put in, uh, well, one, members of one group of them were put in little uh, wagons, and the other group were put in little harnesses to pull the wagons around. So, uh, so these kittens are, one group is passively experiencing this rather limited visual world, just some bars on the wall and so on. And the other group is driving uh, in that, or actually engaging in interacting with the environment. Uh, and and uh, guess what? Uh, the passive group didn't see so well after that. In other words, it wasn't their visual systems didn't seem to be functioning at the same level as the group that had been the active group engaging with the environment. Well, there are all sorts of other examples of that sort of thing. If you put prisms on someone that shift the world to the right or left, and then what you do is you sort of move their arms passively to teach them about where things are in the world. It really doesn't work so well as if you have them engage in interacting with the world. Well, we can go on and on about that, with examples of this sort of action-oriented nature of perception. And also, I, I was, I, I really don't know a great deal at all about Buddhism, but there was some interesting things that come up from time to time in some of the texts on this particular subject, and mainly that I've gotten through talking with Eleanor Roche, at, who's a, um, a colleague at Berkeley, the psychology department, and her notion, or one thing that was said, well, seeing um, doesn't lead uh, to action, then of what use? is seeing. And I quickly translated that into, if hearing doesn't lead to action, then of what use is hearing. And, uh, so I think of, of uh, our auditory facility, and there, aren't, there isn't anywhere near the amount of experimental result about how it's action-oriented, but it certainly must be. And uh, I would think, and in fact, I get sort of worried about the state that when I reflect on this, maybe we can reflect on this collectively, that in music today, you know, we're, we're really experiencing music in a somewhat different way since the advent of the recording. And, uh, well, you know, it, it used to be, in fact, even when I was a youth, my mother would come home and play something on the piano. Or she, was, she was always performing as a musician. Uh, not really well, but she, she that was part of the thing was, was to actually play the music and play the music you just heard in a theater or, and so on. And nowadays it seems that we have a lot of our musical experience presented in this passive form. Well, it seems like that there's some kind of dilemma there. Maybe, I don't know, I'm actually going to argue after it's all said and done that we're all, it, when we're really listening, well, let's say, or we're listening actively, and that we actually have something like a body in our mind, uh, a model of the body, and that, that's probably a very important part of our listening experience. So, but anyway, I do worry about 
this aspect. And I, I guess I, I don't get too tormented by it, but I, I do think that if one is engaged in controlling something, that uh, one ends up sort of hearing it or seeing it somewhat differently. And uh, let me give you I, my couple of, couple of examples come to mind. Uh, I once watched uh, a trombonist that wasn't charged taking a dictate. That I mean, uh, he was asked to write down what notes were being played. He was actually synthesizing uh, the sort of slide position to help in the process of recognizing what had been uh, played. Um, oftentimes when we uh, think about how we recognize and hear speech, there's this notion of actually acting the speech. There's a, for a long time in, in the speech perception literature, there's something known as the motor theory of speech perception. In other words, but that one didn't work out so well. But the point I want to make here is that we seem to perceive by synthesis. There seems to be an active, we're actively constructing the world. Uh, and uh, this sort of fits in with this uh, embodied perception uh, notion very well. So um, there, there are uh, other examples of this analysis, uh, synthesis, and I think you all have experienced this when you're reading your text and you realize that words are missing. At least when I'm proofreading, I'm always synthesizing the missing words of my text and having to have someone else go over my text because I can't see it anymore. I just possibly uh, fooled by uh, what I see. Another uh, thing that I think is worth pointing out that is um, related to how the mind, in some sense, mirrors the world and the experiences we have with the world. And this notion, we were, we were talking about it earlier, of effort came up and about how effort is perceived. And I think um, in music, it's very important that the sense of a dynamic in music, I believe, has more often to do with the sense of effort as perceived as part of the listener, rather than just the mere DB level. I mean, we can very easily <laughs> recognize a scream as, you know, or a, a, a loud uh, a vocal utterance of some kind, even though the level on the uh, uh, playback system is turned way down. And we don't necessarily get that same emotional experience out of it if we turn the level way up and uh, uh, work it away. So there's something about the um, sort of signatures on these sounds that have to do with their, how they signify the effort uh, uh, that's being played. And I think that's, that's very important. So we're perceiving things as if they're oftentimes emanating from objects in the real world, even if those sounds are synthetic in, in character. So because, uh, one of my favorite examples along those lines is this experiment, uh, I, I like to talk about experiments because I, I really, I was trained as an experimental psychologist and I really, and I, since there's a philosopher here, I feel like I have to get some revenge. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say that uh, over here in this glass, we're going to have the listener, all right? And uh, this is a loudspeaker that has a little light bulb on top of it, right here. And here's another loudspeaker, quite a bit further away, that has another light bulb on top of it. But these loudspeakers aren't even connected. Hidden from the view of the listener is this loudspeaker, where the sound's actually coming from. Now, what we do is we're asking the listener now to indicate how loud he thinks the sound is coming from this speaker. The light goes on. This sound is played. He judges the loudness, then we randomly mix everything up and present this one, yet it's still coming out of this speaker. So he's visually seeing two different distances, and guess what uh, he says about the loudnesses of these two sounds? They're always the same. Any guesses? <laughs> Tom, you know all this stuff. <laughs> one further away is louder? Yes. Yeah, very, very strong effect. One that's further away is judged as being louder. Because if it's the same level and it's that far away, my God, it's got to be really loud. Just an example of how the visual system and the 
auditory system are interacting, and yet how we're sort of judging things with respect to what the source is like, not what the experience is like, but what we infer about the object out in the real world. Well, I mean, I certainly go along with Trevor Wishart earlier. I do like to think about these fantasy things. And so, but if we as musicians or composers don't realize that the people who are receiving these things have the world mirroring <coughs> in their mind, then, I mean, we should think about that. If we're, in other words, I don't think you can just be arbitrary in how you build sound material. One should think about the ecology of that sound material. Okay. Now, uh, any any questions on these uh, remarks? I just maybe summarizing. I want to argue that uh, we need to interact with the world to develop a full-fledged perceptual apparatus. That uh, we, in fact, uh, have in our mind some kind of model of the world, and. Uh, so those are the two points that I think I've tried to make so far. Can I just, now, yes. Can I ask a question just about that experiment. Yes. The treatment. I mean, did you try that with all kinds of uh, different kinds of EQ, for example, with a very bass present sound with hardly any top, and did you try it with like extreme? Well, I, I didn't actually do this experiment, but no, I, it wasn't done. They were, they were at the same level, and indeed there might be a bit of high frequency loss here uh, because of the. No, it's always coming from here. See, I didn't fool myself for a second. <laughs> <laughs> it's always constant, so it's the same. It's always the same sound. The, the, the sound never changes. The point is the visual context. But yeah, if the if the high frequency was rolled off, then it might help suggest that it's further away. Yeah, because we know the type. Of thing. But no, the idea was that it's always the same. It's just this visual cue that's giving the tip off as to um, the actual. Uh, I mean, the experience of Lavasin. Okay. Um, anyway, let's move on a bit and let's talk a bit about this control business. Um, I'd like to make a distinction between what's called exploration and control. And uh, and I'd like to say that control and, and, and is, is is something that we do when we're trying to provide a good match between what we intend to happen and what really happens. I mean, we really want to get, you know, I want to say ah, and I hear ah come out. But, um, and so the goal of control is to match, have the, you know, the change that we, you know, the artifact that we produce in the world match the intentions that we have. But uh, that's not what we do all the time. Uh, I mean, most of the time, at least, if you, for me, I, I'd like to spend more time not so much worrying about this control problem as worrying about the exploration problem. Now, what's the exploration? The exploration problem is one where you essentially try to learn something about the relationships between control commands and the resulting sound. In other words, it's not, I don't have a goal. I'm going to babble. In other words, if I were uh, exploring my speech apparatus, what would I do? I'd babble. I wouldn't, you know, I'd go, uh, I mean, I, you know, or I had an instrument, I would try different embouchures, I'd try different positions. I wouldn't necessarily have any desire to create a particular type of sound, just exploring the space of an instrument, exploring the relationship between the various controlling influences I can have on it and the final outcome. Now, I would like to argue that for most of what we do in motor skill learning, that we need the proper combination of exploration and control. In other words, that we need to have some. If we don't explore, well, I, you know, I don't think Michael Jordan got to where he is without a lot of exploration of the outcomes of his, you know, the various gestures and so on. And then, of course, once he knew something about the relationship between his abilities to move the ball around and what the ball actually did. He was then able to have his intentions go into, into play and make the ball do what he was done, and then correct errors at the same time over this whole whole loop. So um, I don't know if that clarifies the result, but I, I was hearing a lot of 
nervousness here in the, in the audience in, and the, among the speakers, too, about the idea of being in control. That somehow was a, had a negative connotation or something. But on the other hand, I, I don't think it, um, it, it, it does. I, but, I, but I do think that exploration, on the other hand, what would include this, and we can see that a lot of times what we want to do is, is really hear, as in, at least in my own musical explorations, I want to hear something happen. And I'm not sure at all uh, what will happen. But I'm interested in the, the learning something about the relationship between what I did and what happened. That, and I could do that without any specific intention. But on the other hand, I like in other situations to be in control, so to speak. That is to say, I want to get this effect. I want this to happen and have it happen. And perform, learn how, have, have, have a grip on the feedback that allows me to bring things under, under that kind of control in this sort of uh, oftentimes very, very difficult, uh, I mean, very difficult to control uh, system. Now, I could, it turns out that those very ideas that I talked about are really kind of important subjects in robotics, and they're important subjects in, in, in the, what's called the inverse problem. Uh, the inverse problem is, it's a good one to just mention, I don't want to go into the technical details. Um, let's say that uh, I'm trying to build a synthesizer by looking at the way an instrument works. So I look at what the instrument produces, and then I look at the control barriers that, that are going in. So I, well, no, I'm actually looking at the control variables going in, and now I'm going to look at what comes out. But what somehow I want to do is figure out how to get the right control variables to produce the desired result. So I want to, I want to, I want this super good ah, okay, out of my mouth. So I want to find out what do I have to do to produce that, and so I have to sort of invert that to get back to the controller inputs. Well, I mean, I mean, the uh, paint factory might have this difficulty. The bucket of paint comes out, and you want to get a certain recipe out of the whole thing. That's much more interesting than it could be a restaurant. So I've got, <laughs> I've got this dish that's just wonderful. And now I say, how could I sort of invert the process of producing it and figure out how to produce that from some uh, few sets of rows? So I sort of look at the problem backwards. And it turns out that a lot of such systems aren't invertible. You can't really do it. A lot of the natural systems that we work in the world, you can't do, it, you can't do that inversion because of this. Many to one. It's a problem of the number of variables involved. It's a degrees of freedom problem. So the technical jargon, I don't want to get into it. But let me just say, speech appears to be one of these things that we can't simply invert. And so we've got to invent this. I mean, this, and this is the exploration business seems to help solve that particular problem. Okay, I'll leave that aside. Now let's talk about the body <laughs> business for a minute. Um, some more. Uh, I want to. Does anyone know Neil Todd? Is this right? Well, well not I can say anything about it, I guess. But <laughs> he's, a, he's a really interesting uh, um, music cognition person. In, uh, he's at uh, Manchester now. And uh, he's been very strong on the notion that. The way our body works has something to do with the way we perceive and produce rhythm. And uh, he's introduced the notion that maybe what's going on in our motor control center in the brain, which is located back here called the cerebellum, is really a uh, model of one's body, uh, one's own body. And how it actually, and he speaks about this in control theory terms, and he talks about it being the far, a forward model. And uh, he suggests that we, in experiencing rhythmic music in particular, or music that might be called groove-based music, or something like that there was an actual pulsation going on, or a strong rhythmic pulse, that we're using this model to uh, experience that music. In other words, that our auditory, that we're actually uh, doing this sort of analysis synthesis process with this internal model of our own body. Well, how might you... Now, now I'll tell you the experiment he did, but it's only one of many, and I don't want to, because this seems like a crazy thing to do. He, he asked, he said, 
Well, what I ought to do is go around and just make a bunch of measurements of the body, and uh, like the width of the shoulders and lengths of the arm and that sort of thing, and then see if any of those measures of the shape of the body correlate with what's called the personal tempo. Now, the personal tempo is uh, where you feel the groove is. Now, I, 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 Paul Press wouldn't talk about it this way, but, uh, <laughs> but the idea is, is if you ask someone to just tap at a what felt like a good rate, they'd tap somewhere between about oh, 300 milliseconds between taps and 900 milliseconds, that'd be on the slow side. So this is what in musical terms is called the tactus are in everyday language is the beat. And uh, people have different, somewhat different preferences for where they feel their best beat. And there's another way you can get at it. There's some tunes like Three Blind Mice and the Living Pell Overture and so on that actually have the same rhythmic pattern, but you hear the tune as, you know, Three Blind Mice if it was played in a slow tempo and Living Pell was fast, and then, etc. So he used a variety of techniques to get his personal tempo, and lo and behold, this, the width of the shoulders correlated rather highly with the personal tempo, with the big, broad shoulders being slower than the narrow And so this sort of locomotion idea uh, uh, was tied into it. And I know it sounds like a a quirky experiment. Neil's a quirky guy, but uh, I found it very interesting and part of a configuration of, of uh, results. Um, so there's another one that I really like. I, 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 this, this one surprised me. This is called the bimanual advantage. And uh, so, you know, here, here, if you just tap with one hand and you look at how much slop there is in the tapping. So how accurately are people tapping? Now, what's the variance line? So you just tap with one hand, and you measure that to get an indication of the you know, degree in which the, the inter-beat interval is, uh, is varying. And then you ask people to tap with two limbs this way. Well, guess what happens? Less variance, markedly less variance. Three limbs, markedly less variance. Four limbs, even less. So I, now, every time I watch a drum, I can't <laughs> tell, but notice this kind of tendency to have all those limbs going at the same time. Now, uh, the theory of why this is so is a bit um, hard. It's a bit hard to explain, and I'm not going to go into it, but I can give you some references about the debate that's produced in the motor skill uh, literature and about the debate in particular about what it says about what kind of clocks we've got in our uh, system. Uh, the, it, it's, it's been, certainly we, the, the multiple clock theories don't work. Uh, it, well, uh, well, we don't have a really good theory of why this bimanual advantage works the way it does, but it's, it's a very clear and strong effect. Again, indicating something about the body in our production and in, in more than likely the perception as well. Okay, let's see. Any questions? Ah, I know that I have to say something about this. Because it seems to me that much of what we're going to do is another kind of topic thread that ties into these other things. I want to say something about what's called in the um, motor skill literature and so on, automaticity. That is, um, motor, well, like walking on a stone-filled trail. You know, we can do that without stumbling, too often anyway, and talk to our partners or to walking. We can actually navigate a fairly rough and varied terrain in a way that seems quite automatic, or at least involves what might be called tacit knowledge. That is, our, a non-conscious uh, interaction with the uh, world. In other words, we don't have to have uh, all of the detail of the terrain available in awareness, at least in, in this kind of conscious awareness, in order to navigate. For some reason, in, in a lot of, let's say, aesthetic judgments that have been made over the years, it seems to me that automaticity has sort of been downgraded, always just acting like a, it's just an automatic pilot, right? And what, could, what art could that be? Well, I'd 
argue that uh, this tacit knowledge, or these, these kinds of uh, activities, can actually make a great deal of use uh, of what the environment is, and are highly acculturated. That is, that they have a lot to do with the kind of culture that we could uh, that would have to do with the playing of music, the performing of dance, etc. So I just I wanted to say a few words about that. And I'm struck by a book that I recently got, and I haven't read it. It's awfully thick. It's called <laughs> The User Illusion. Uh, this is by Tor. George, help me out again. I can. Neurotrinders. 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 Yeah. Well, this. Um, what. what uh, his argument is that we've overrated the role of consciousness uh, in that, uh, uh, in other words, that the user, the user illusion, I think that's the title captures it uh, uh, right away, that somehow we're in this sort of state of conscious control when indeed much of our, our ordinary, everyday, all the time activities are uh, tacit or unavailable uh, to us, but yet highly acculturated and attuned to the world. Okay. Any, I'm going to stop there and then I'll move into the practical. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this last point, I just, um, it's true, especially for motor skills, on the other hand, one can learn to access that information that one has learned in order to tacitly navigate the world. And I think some of that learning, which is again, I know I've done amusement training a lot, is um, highly interesting because it does change your perception yeah, I think I think so. In fact, um, it must be that what one does when you're doing mindfulness, I mean, it must be that trying to be mindful is something like this, in a way of trying to get access to this more passive knowledge. And maybe that, well, I, I think of mindfulness maybe as being something like that, but then I'm also reminded of this, uh, I think it was a Philip K. Dick uh, short story that I read some years back. I can't remember the exact title, but here was a man who decided he was going to gain voluntary control over all of his sort of inherent uh, automatic activities, like breathing, heart rate, this kind of thing. So he, he wanted to bring them all under voluntary control. And it got to be a burden. <laughs> okay, and I think what happened in the story was he, he lost control. Uh, in other words, he kind of had a lapse of attention. But, but, what, I, but what I'm saying is through the direction of attention that you can, uh, well, I hate to use this analogy of a 3D computer game, but, but you know, the, 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 you, the, the, what is rendered is what's seen in front of you but that when you direct the attention of the player. Just because it, because that becomes highly rare. So that's something that the games now do. But I think that consciously, our awareness, our attention is also able to do that. And access surprising information, which is uh, filtered or uh, based um, physically <coughs> in the body itself. Uh, Believe me, I, mean, I, 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 I would agree with you very much. I'm only trying to, the scale is so heavy, heavily weighted on me side of, of this sort of uh, knowledge that we have available in some symbolic, uh, simple, useful and, and the idea that we have to be I'm talking about experiential knowledge. Yeah. Well, it's also different from music and from dance. I think that's very interesting. We come from a highly articulated, highly intellectual, like, rational history of our art. And dance, I think, is quite proceeding in the other direction from a very bodily oriented consciousness. But it's still intellectual. It's still technical. I mean, it, 
there must be a space in which we can accept both this notion mm -hmm. of authenticity yeah. and the kind of things that Kate was talking about. And I don't see a real conflict here at all. Yeah. And, but I think the danger that I, that I sort of started to notice was in really insisting on that it was really going to be intellectual, it was really going to be real art, that we had to have this sort of, had to be weighed on a particular vision of, of, of consciousness, which was, which was basically this notion of conscious symbolic representation. And we couldn't really make that integration. That was where I was having the problem. But then I thought about the giant steps problem. And then I started yeah. to think, well, you know, how do you get, you know, you know giant steps to be kind of John Coleman. It was very hard to play many because there's a lot of chords that go very fast. And I don't know, you, you, you know, what do you think? Is that, is that an example of something? Well, I would think so because the people who learn those, I mean, they, in a the sense, they there's a lot of authenticity in it. Going through those changes, which I mean, I don't think we're going to do very well at this point without some, uh, I mean, some of the stuff be under your hand, so to speak. But you're not making conscious decisions. I mean, that's I, right. You've learned to choose. You've learned to choose. Now I'm going to go yeah. and learn it and choose flat major seven because you're too late. It's gone. Right. That's right. But David, when well, you know, maybe this is a. Um, let me say something about the, fact that the form that some of this knowledge may take in the way it would be referenced. Neil Todd argues in his work that um, the uh, the word that he uses is the cerebellum is a Smith predictor. Now, let's, you know, let's not worry about what a Smith predictor is at all, but I, I mean, he's very specific about a certain control theory model. Now, let's say you've got a big plant of some kind, a chemical plant, you're trying to you know, have the uh, input variables that you're dumping in there and so on, <coughs> produce the desired result at the output, maybe that bucket of paint I referred to earlier. Well, that process may take days. Uh, in other words, there may be some <coughs> operations that take a long time, and then by the time you end up with the uh, final result, the feedback loop is just too long to be corrected. So the only way to make this plant work efficiently is to build a model of the plant that you can use to predict the behavior of the plant and then refine the model of the plant. So here we are with, in our brains, a model of our bodies that enable us to make predictions about where they are in this model gets trained and is probably part of that whole passive knowledge network is the way I, 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 I would tend to see it. That when you uh, develop an instrument, is that a tested knowledge of something you deal with or you try to avoid dealing with? Let's talk about it with the example. Yeah, I have some examples where I think it, it's clear that I, I, I think about that. I mean, because I don't, you, or I pass it. Yeah, because <laughs> when, you, when you develop a new yeah. instrument, that, that tested knowledge might not be available, or you might be happy with the fact that it's not available. Yeah. Well, let's see what happens. Let me just let me shift gears if there, if there, to the other the musical examples now. And uh, okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about now? Yeah, one yet another question. Yes, yeah, just Andy, in, in the case of um, uh, I'm a puppeteer. In the case of, of, uh, of puppeteers and theater people, they do. And I was just thinking about what you were saying. The um, there's a tendency to to try to program that kind of response so that because uh, I mean, puppeteers practice over and over again. There are, there are things that I can do now as puppeteers, a little bit like working on learning to ride a bicycle, that are now involuntary. They're in, I mean, whether you use a word like instinctive or a word like passive knowledge, there are things that I couldn't do. I remember that I had to learn this, and that I spent hours and hours and hours practicing certain gestures, which have now become uh, unconscious and involuntary in a sense, in that they become part of you know part of the practice of, of uh, performance, and it's something that any actor tries to accomplish just by repeating, repeating the gesture over and over again, so that it becomes as quote unquote natural as walking down the street. So there's that kind of you know that, that introduces the possibility, I guess, of musical performance as well of of a, a programmable kind of passive knowledge that may not necessarily be part of the, the well, I guess I'd like to yeah. ask you is if let's imagine that you suddenly found yourself with a misadjustment between the height of the stage or some variable went wrong right. that would mean you'd have to adapt your passive knowledge to a new situation. And how about you? Yeah, that the correction of errors is, is built into the. Yeah. I mean, for example, when you when you move a puppet arm, um, the string might have loosened up a little bit or something, and, and as it, as the arm moves outward, unlike a human arm, there might be a little bit of a wobble, which 
you with your fingertips attached to the rod, you know, immediately kind of right. interact. You know, it's like, like manipulating chopsticks. Mm -hmm. but, but I think, as you were talking about this yesterday over at lunch, I believe, and uh, it's, it, there's more than one thing going on. It's true that the learned motor skill activity mm -hmm. is going on and varied according to conditions. And simultaneously, a performer also directs their attention uh, directing their attention, responding to, for example, we were talking about the size of the audience and how a change in um, the size of the gesture so that somebody far away could read it. And uh, this is this is all, it's um, real time, online uh, processing that occurs and it has to do with not only the, the tacit knowledge and the skills, the motor skills, but also an inclusion of direction of attention and um, Attention. So I think all of the, it's, it's important to distinguish um, and in, include all of the variables when I think about it. I think, I think that the um, physicists think Bolin has an interesting idea on that one, but the concept of enfolding and unfolding. And all these, the, the, the example that he gives is, is riding a bicycle, where in order to keep up, you always have to turn into where you're where you falling. And if you think about that, you can't do it. But if you unfold that knowledge in, and you unfold those conceptualizations that you need to allow you to um, yeah, keep track of what's unfolding. So then you can see all those things as part of the one continuum with only certain aspects coming to the surface. Because that's a kind of consciousness too, where the other point made about consciousness is that to, to think I am now going to do this was conscious activity is not only thought. You know, the, the body, the, the a, a, action, but it's not only thought. Thought is one part of it. But yeah. Self consciousness can be as deadly to a performer as it is to, you know, someone trying to climb a ladder. You know. Well, I, I, maybe a certain form. I guess I don't know what consciousness is. I, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, I do know what this is to be sort of, if you have this ability to sort of explain and control it in, in some sense. And I, but I, I think, for example, that we can have a kind of purely musical consciousness, for example, that we can actually uh, uh, have a reaction that is in some sense uh, at a level of awareness about what we're doing. I mean, I'm not speaking about the automaticity, which is, which is just a, a musical thought. Uh, and I'm sure that our artists can have visual thoughts. That are, and a lot of thought is non-symbolic, non-Cartesian non theater, or whatever. Um, Maybe any other? Yeah, back there. Well, I, uh, there, there are two things on the. On the uh, there, there are recent experiments that are done in England on on this uh, this problem of the autonomous action and the and the, and the conscious thought. And the, the very simple experiment they did was to tell uh, the subject to to when a dot appeared on the screen that they should click on that dot, but they shouldn't click on the second time it appeared, only the first time. And uh, the users invariably clicked the second time. They couldn't, they, they had taken the instruction and they had made it into a response action that was faster than conscious thought, but they couldn't actually shut down the, the autonomous action in time to keep themselves from reacting to the second appearance of the dog on the screen. So there's this sort of like, the, there's a very tight coupling in real time between these two things, but, um, but they are actually separate, appear to be separate uh, operations. Um, the other thing that uh, on our older and motor task that uh, is sort of confuses what we call the autonomic or uh, conscious action or, or intention is uh, that if, if you have uh, an older and task and then you consider it in such a way that you come up with a description of it, um, so uh, let's say you're very good at something and then you describe exactly how it is that you accomplish it. Um, usually the problem that occurs at that point is that, is that the person ends up believing their description instead of instead of remembering how it is that they accomplish the action. And at that point, they execute the description, and they're much worse at, that, at whatever that overlearned task is at that point. 
Um, it turns out that, that only a lot of times the only way to relearn an overlearned task is to somehow describe it. Um, so if you've got an error, it's one of the few ways that you can actually access those those things. But if you take a perfectly thing, something you're perfectly good at, and you over uh, and you're overly conscious of it, it will actually. But the, I mean, the funny thing is that traditionally, psychology this has always been considered to be overlearned tasks are always considered to be trivial. Which I, I like the idea that it's, it's actually the substantial things that. You, you just maybe opened up some floodgates, Ralph. I don't know whether you can deal with this now or whether it's appropriate, <laughs> but um, I'm just wondering to what extent what you're talking about, um, descriptability of, of a task, um, to what extent that should be lined up with the problem of how far notation can go in musical or choreographic systems. Um, how, how, how much do we flog the dead horse? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that if we, if we discuss improvisation without in parallel, um, raising the issues of notation and um, the, the prescribing uh, action as opposed to what we call the free action, binding this to I think that's Well, I, I think, the, I think the, I, in, in that context, the idea of the, the actually, Joel, as we say about this, but the idea of creating a, uh, a notation which is actually these overlearned tasks. And, uh, and, you, and, you assemble, and you assemble those. Um, it's a very good description. Well, that's <laughs> what I thought. Wasn't that what Tim was doing today? He was getting this alphabet uh, business with the juggle. Uh, I was, I mean, that was a fascinating aspect to see. Mm -hmm. But, but he, was also talking, he was also talking about the fact that uh, in order to learn the Actually, my favorite example of this is the William Burroughs uh, Doing Easy project, which um, 